Now on the S4 Sponsor stage is the session from Dispel. Please welcome Ian Schmertzler to the S4 Sponsor stage. Yay! Hi, everyone. So my name is Ian. I'm the President and Chief Financial Officer of Dispel. I will note before we start doing this that there have been a lot of salespeople up here who know how to give presentations and do it over and over. I am not one of them. I'm an industrial engineer, and I suspect our marketing department is already getting it, but I was given responsibility for making this presentation. So the bones are good, even if the polish is not there. In any case, the reason why I'm here and why we are spending $15,000 to talk to you for 30 minutes is that you guys live in worlds that are full of sensors and analytics tools. And those analytics tools are becoming increasingly effective at giving you really good advice. The problem is that the so what that you often hear your colleagues saying when it comes to, I need another sensor or I need another analytics tool, is you don't just want to see that the generator is on fire or going to catch on fire. What you want to be able to do is act on the data that you are gathering. And what that currently requires is doing one of three things. If it's the middle of the day and you've got a specialist on site, this is pretty easy. You call them, they show up, they make the problem go away. If it's a remote installation, wind farm, solar, in, uh, solar site, or an automated well site, well, then you've got to get the specialist in a truck and drive them out there. The third option, if you care about cybersecurity, which I think most of you do, is that you send them through a 5 to 15 minute login process. And that presumes they know what they are doing at each step of the way. This is the area that we focus on. So what does Dispel do? Two things, but for the purposes of this conversation, we do one that is rapid, secure, remote access. That's it. We get your operators to their equipment in three seconds. We get your vendors to their equipment in 12 to 15 seconds. If you are running an AI, so this would be a Mitsubishi Mel IPC 5000 or 2000 series or a Rockwell Automation APC, we provide that with a sustained, geographically resilient connection. We give your administrators positive control over the system. And all of these features allow you, as IT security professionals, the excuse to upgrade your networks to a moving target defense posture. So what does this do? Well, let's go through that five to 15 minute login experience for a minute. This is a day in the life. You've got a SCADA cluster over here. You've noticed that there's a problem with it or your operator has. Your operator's over here. Uh, let's say it might be a specialist who happens to service several facilities or it's that vendor who's out in Thailand looking back at your system. Well, what they typically do, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but this is a usual variation, is the first thing that happens is they VPN into the corporate network. We are presuming for the moment that you are not allowing anyone to do UDP hole punching. But they're v they VPN'd in. If it's an operator, that's fine. If it's a vendor, they're crashing around now inside of your network. That's not great, but OK, you're letting it happen. Then they come to the jump host. And this is the moment where if it's an operator who doesn't do this regularly, they flip up their keyboard, they look for their password, they remember how to punch it in, they call up IT. We've all been there, right? Then they go, and they find themselves on another jump post. This is the SCADA jump post. They do the same thing, and once they go through that, they do an RDP connection, and bang, they're in their SCADA cluster. This looks elegant. And that's part of the problem. So for network engineers, you see this and you say, well, that's fine. That's how it works. And it's just four steps. But in practice, this tends to take 12 to 15 minutes if people remember what they're doing. What we do that is different, and I hope that the presentation moves it, but it does not, is that you punch in your username and password, you do your MFA, and next thing you know, bang, you're in. Usually takes 12 seconds. So the end result of that, to use one customer who was very kind enough to speak to their CFO, is that their estimated savings in the case of Connecticut water, which oddly enough protects both the water supplies of Connecticut, Maine, parts of San Jose, and the like, is they reported savings of approximately $1 million in their first year in time saved alone from their employees. More importantly for the IT security team is they were no longer hated by their operations people because connection was no longer the primary impediment to doing work. So why is this hard? To understand that, we need to go and do a bit of a background on cybersecurity and 
the broad theme. For lack of an alternative option, cybersecurity has long been this exercise in building castles. And as time and money allow, you add additional walls or you improve the ones that you already have. Now, that strategy is called static defense, and it fell out of fashion in the physical world because unless you correctly anticipate the types of attacks that will be launched against you, and then you have the time to build defenses against those attacks, someone will find you, analyze you, work the problem, and punch a hole through. So the solution in the physical world was to stop building castles and instead start putting the things you cared about into vehicles, moving them around. Now that strategy is called moving target defense, a classic tactical implementation of which would be a submarine. And Dispel holds the patents on being able to automatically build and maintain moving target defenses at a network level. That does not mean we were the ones who came up with moving target defense, by the way. This has been something that's been around for over a decade. Back in 2008, folks started to build it by hand. By 2011, it was becoming a necessity. And now, you come into the later part of the decade, people are using moving target defense in all sorts of different ways. Argonne National Lab being the most elegant, uh, eloquent amongst them. So why does this matter for you, and not just for people with stars on their shoulders? Well, this is your world, A and B. And almost every vendor you are going to encounter here or at any other cybersecurity event is going to say, well, A and B talk to one another, so we're going to protect this by encrypting the traffic stream between the two of them. But as an attacker, when we're dealing with an industrial control system, I do not care about the content of this traffic stream. It's just sensor data and commands. What I really care about is finding A or B to launch an attack directly against them. And when you're dealing with an OT environment, it doesn't typically look like this. It typically looks like this. So it is very easy to locate the target of value. What we do that's different is, first, we don't kid around when it comes to encryption. We use two layers of AES-256 with independent 4096-bit keys for the initial key exchange. If you're worried about the post-quantum era, yes, we can put in a super singular isogeny key encapsulation technique instead of the 4096. That's fine. But what we do that's much more important than that is we add a moving target defense layer in between A and B so that they are disassociated from one another. Now, this used to be the sort of thing which most people said, great, that's fine, government is dealing with that, that is not my problem. But in the past year, this has become a real problem for people in the commercial world. A good example of this, which the British and Dutch governments were good enough to compile, and now I'm breaking a cardinal rule by mentioning other, mentioning other companies' names, is that static VPNs, because they don't move, and in spite of the fact that they are built by incredibly good engineers, for example, Pulse Secure, Fortinet, Palo Alto, F5, the Cisco, if any of you are dealing with not CV19781 right now, we all know what's going on. But the issue is they don't change. When someone comes up with a patch for it, yes, you can implement it quickly. But let's say an attacker looks at the patch and says, well, I wonder why that weakness was there. I wonder if I can't develop a weapon against it. Folks have been able to develop tables of the locations of all the known IP, of all of the VPNs associated with different pro providers. So when they develop an attack against it, they just hit the whole table. And the result of that is, unless you are constantly and correctly anticipating the attack and building a defense against it, they're going to nail you, even if you weren't the intended target. What's different with moving target defense is there is no target that's fixed that you can go after. So this type of attack doesn't happen. So why now? Uh, usually, if you're a cybersecurity person and you have a budget, the previous slides matter enough to say, OK, that's why we should do it now. But most of you don't have enough clout or money to do that on your own. What really works is the fact that this is a faster way of connecting to something. You distract them with that, you go to the operations team, they say, yes, this is a miserable experience, I want to fix it right now. The other thing is it's the first quarter. This is the time of year when big companies get the little things right. And that way the rest of the year works. Now, then to the grammatically incorrect, how now? In answer to that, First, I know you guys have budgets that typically turn once a year. If we've missed it and you just want to try it, it's free. If you want to deploy it, tell us what your discretionary budget is. We'll come in magically $50 underneath what it is that you can spend, and you'll get to deploy it, and then we'll true it all up when we come to the next budgetary year. So finally, what we need, if you think this is interesting, 
please put us in front of your operational technologies teams. We'll give them a briefing, we'll give them a way to try it. If they love it, they're going to start supporting you in doing this, and you're going to have a more secure environment as a result. On that note, thank you very much. Any questions? How do we build these? So what we're doing is we're, we tie into all of the major public cloud providers around the globe. There are little ones that we don't, if you need us to, we'll get into them. But what we do is we launch virtual machines from these different cloud providers, and we network them together into a single tenant network. That network serves as the remote access channel. When the person is done making the connection, we destroy that network, or parts of it. It's up to the discretion of the administrator. And then there's another one that's built and put into inventory in the queue. So the result is that you have these single-use, single-tenant networks, which, once you're done with them, are cycled back into the pools of processing power available for the different public cloud providers. I'd add that if you're dealing with a regulated environment where you need to screen record or live stream your connections, because it's a virtual environment that we're building, we just bolt those things in. You can tie it back to a seam if everything's speaking syslog. Uh, the question for everyone else is, and how do you permit access? What's the authentication mechanism? Correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that is. So there are two answers to that. We have a standard approach of we either throw you up a console which says, here's your username, password, and your multi-factor, but typically what we're doing is we're going into environments which you have already, where you have already set up your previously approved mechanism of approval, uh, authentication, excuse me, and we just tie into that. On the back end, once you get to the facility, there's the question of, well, I've, got, I've given this person remote access to reach down to these different job sites. How do I control what happens once they get to those networks? The answer is that we are placing a piece of physical hardware on site, which is responsible, one, for knowing how to find these networks when they're spun up, but also we have user-specific whitelists that are implemented on the box. So they're able to, that's able to restrict the flow of traffic once you reach the facility down to the individual machines.